I would like to call the regular meeting of the Foxborough School Committee on March 18th to order. Visitors will be first, then approval of minutes, teaching and learning highlights, teacher technology integration and document uh, cameras, Elementary Reading Special Education Service Model Review, Special Education Progress Report, Update on Capital Improvement Plan Meeting, FY13 Monthly Budget Statement, Subcommittee Member uh, for Bus Drivers Negotiations, Other Matters, and at the end of the meeting we will, I will call for a roll call vote to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiating strategies with the union personnel, which is school bus drivers, and to discuss school security. The committee will not return to open session after that. Do we have any visitors? Then we can move on to approval of minutes. Does that, anyone have suggestions, corrections? <clears throat> I want to make a motion to accept. Uh, I have a co-worker. I thought I was mistaken in the minutes. Uh, is it just the this, is ju this is just committee members. Oh, sorry. Okay. I make a motion to accept. I need a second. I'll second. Okay. I just have one point of discussion. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> under the uh, superintendent evaluation mid-cycle review, we spent some time talking about um, how to sh shorten up the amount of information we covered and I think we've got that captured here that the committee and superintendent discussed minimizing the amount of reports etc maybe we should just add one more level of detail and say that uh, we also talked about in the future presenting both things we're proud of and things that we're watching um, just as a way to provide a little more clarity and direction on going forward how we want to handle that mid-year review I, 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 I think, think the somewhere. preceding sentence reflects that. Uh, did you think it needs to be stronger in statement? Or? Oh, I'm seeing it. Yep. You see it? Yep. So it's there at the floor. Okay. I'm fine then. Yep. Thank you. I remember you making that point. Right. And I think it was. I missed it in the sentence part. Very good. So I'm good. Okay. All in favor? 5 zero, zero. Teaching and learning highlights. Chair, just, just one yes. briefly before we go into that, I just had a, a clarification that the committee could help me. Um, tonight's executive session is to discuss negotiation strategies with union personnel, school bus drivers, and the professional teachers. And professional uh, teachers. Can it be amended? Can the can this meeting agenda be amended right now? Does it because it wasn't posted? It hasn't been posted for forty eight hours. <coughs> Yeah, I believe Martha's right. Um, yes, I think so. Yeah. It needs to it needs to be posted for forty eight hours. Okay. So we'll have to do that the next time. All right. Teaching and learning highlights, teacher technology integration and document cameras. Ms. Spinelli. Yes. I am happy to bring you tonight's teaching and learning highlight because this is something, you know, as we talk about technology integration, um, we have had the FACES group here before us saying that they're going to fund more document cameras or we're purchasing more through our regular budget. And it's something we've mentioned a lot, but we've never actually had a demonstration of. So um, we're pretty excited. It's a new technology, and we have a teacher and a student here to, to, um, to demonstrate them. So I'd like to invite Mr. Adam Gravitt, a seventh grade math teacher, up. And you can introduce a wonderful student who's going to help you. Come on up to the visitor's table. Bring a chair. I'm going to actually stand because oh, I have the oh, control here too. So I'm very good. Dance. I'm so. going to show. Yes, my name is Adam Gravitt. I'm the 7th and 8th grade math teacher at Ahern, and this is my student, Carolyn Cotillo. She'll be helping me in a minute. Um, so, first off, I know you wanted to hear about the Hover Cam. Um, it's a great new tool. Um, you know, time on learning is a very big thing heard in the classroom, and this is when I f saw this, is the first thing I thought of. Um, Every day you have things that go on in the classroom you want to be able to showcase your students' work. Um, so a great thing, yeah, it is basically a, a, a great way of taking, I have a lot of things in here. Like, mm -hmm. you'll see it projected up on the board in a second. 
So say I have an answer key that I need to go over in class. Um, visuals are important, so I can take my own work and project it up, project it up there. I can always enlarge it. Um, I can hone in on something, uh, move the whole paper around if I need to go to this one question. So that's great just for, on my side. Um, besides, I can always scan something in. This actually allows me to scan a document. So if I have a worksheet that I need to have, I can put on my online website. I can scan the document and by going to the scan feature and then have that that I can just post onto Edmodo or to another site, and I'll talk about Edmodo in a minute. Um, and then a great thing about student work is, you know, I'll give a problem that takes the class five minutes or so to solve, and I'm going around, I'm watching, I see three or four great ways kids solved it. Now, to then say, okay, let's see these ways, I'm gonna have to spend another five minutes for these kids to then put it on the board. I can just take all their kids' notebooks, come up and say, okay, let's put them right here in front of me, and I can say, let's look at this first student. And I can say, okay, look how they did it. We can talk about, hey, they solved it. Then I can take another one, and I can actually u utilize the class time more efficiently. So that is a great thing. I can, um, a big thing with the Common Core right now is being able to critique other people's work. So even on Friday with my seventh grade classes, each group had a problem, and then they all solved it, and we came back together and put one problem at a time. And we said, let's look at the work. Let's see what can we critique, what can we fix, what's good, what's bad. So a lot of students see my work, they see their own work, and they see a textbook. They don't see other students' work. So it's really a great way to quickly and efficiently do it and not lose time by having a, either find another mode to doing it. Um, so those are the, the big highlights to this, is that we can, one, protect other kids' work, two, I can throw something up quickly, um, and those have been extremely beneficial in my classroom. It's been more streamlined. And then one of the biggest things that, since this is just in the baby steps, is I want to start creating video um, tutorials. You see it online. You see, you know, Khan Academy has it. A lot of other ones out there have it. Well, it's great for kids to see either themselves or a classmate, one of their own videos, explaining what we're doing in class. So um, Caroline's here today because she's going to actually make a video. Um, and then we'll, we're going to set that up. She uh, has this random problem that I don't know where she got it from. And she's going to solve it for us. And then we're going to actually, I'll actually get it all set up right now so that we can videotape it. And then what I would do is that I would end up posting it to Edmodo. And for those of you who don't know what Edmodo is, um, it's very similar to Facebook, but it's educational. So it's very secure. Only people who have access and password can enter it. So only st my students in my own classroom can see it. And they can share work. They can share ideas. Um, and then by posting this video, I can say, hey, guys, Look online for the video. If you're having trouble with this problem tonight, I have a video that you can look at to see what, how it's done. So um, this is the problem that's up here. I need to <laughs> set up. Well, actually, that's, I'll leave it big at first. And then when we record, it has to go to a smaller mode. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to see it very well. So. Um, the way you're getting that set up, you, it's a problem that you won the lottery. That's what I'm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, it's a real problem. That I won the lottery. I'm not gonna get, I had to get all, better all my money. That's but, great. Um, <laughs> figured make it a little more interesting. You want to get some tablets in the classroom. So um, let me just go into record mode, which means yeah, that's that's for me out of this. It is a lot smaller to see, unfortunately, but um, takes a couple steps, and I'm not used to working with the laptop. So we select the view that we want to see that's going to get recorded. And then there's going to be an error that pops up. Don't ignore that for a second. And Caroline is going to take over. And uh, once we get this error to go bye bye, she will begin. So let's start error. Don't find that. And here we go. Mr. Gravit just won the lottery. He is feeling very generous and decided to buy his 90 students either an iPad Mini or a Kindle Fire HD. iPad Minis cost $350 and the Kindle Fire HD cost $300. Mr. Gravit spent $29,000 on his students. How many iPad Minis and Kindle Fire HD did Mr. Gravit buy? All right, first you need an X and a Y variable. X would represent the iPad Minis and Y would represent the Kindle Fire. Now you need two equations, the total cost 
in the total tablets. The total tablets is X, which is the iPad minis, plus Y, which is the Kindle Fire, equals the 90 students. The total cost is 350, which is how much the iPad minis cost, plus 300, which is how much the Kindle Fires cost, equals the $29,000. I'm going to use elimination method. I'm going to write the two equations down. The goal of this is to eliminate one variable, so I'm going to times this by 300. 300x plus 300y equals 27,000. And I'm going to drag this right here. 300x plus 300y equals 27,000. Minus this. These cancel out. So 50x equals 2,000. 2,000 divided by 50, x equals 40 iPad minis. You're not done yet. <laughs> you have to plug the iPad minis into the x. So 40 plus y equals 90 minus 40 to the 90. Y equals 50 Kindle Fire HD. But to check to see if your answer is right, you plug it into the second equation. 350x plus 300y equals 29,000. 350 <coughs> times 40 plus 300 times of 50 equals 29,000. 350 times 40 equals 14,000 plus 300 times 50 equals 15,000 equals 29,000. 14,000 plus 15,000 is 29,000. Which means your answer is correct. Mr. Gravit, <coughs> but 40 iPad minis <coughs> and 50 Kindle Fire HDs. Thank you very much. That's a lot of pressure. I know it's a lot of pressure too. Excellent job. All right. So um, this obviously we uh, just finished a unit on solving systems of equations, and one of the methods was elimination. And she did a beautiful job showing exactly how to do it. And in a perfect world, I would definitely do this if I could. So um, now what we would do with this is I can take this video. Um, it takes sometimes a little while for it to render. Um, and once it renders, I can then take it, and as you can see in the right column, I'm doing video two, it looks like it hasn't turned over to a file yet. So once that happens, I can then take that and then bring it over to Edmodo. Um, and then have, Edmodo has an app called YouTube SchoolTube, just like YouTube, um, but it's all school-friendly videos. And then I upload it to that, which then links to Edmodo. And then well, my goal is to start creating a file, an archive, um, of everything you possibly can have. So, and that's what it, uh, that's what this has. You can create a whole file, all the different type of videos and all the different type of scans you put in, and they can be documents that this can be educational in the classroom. So, um, that is a an overall thing, uh, just of how this camera works. It really is a wonderful tool. Um, it, it just it makes the class time so much easier. And it, even if I forget, oh no, I can't. I didn't scan that into. Computer, I can scan it right here, or if I don't, I can just show the work quickly right there. Um, it saves a lot of time. Even the textbook, I can take the textbook, throw it right underneath it. Um, so kids always have that visual because kids need that visual. They can see, so they're not just hearing what I'm saying. So even if there were like a a, a chart or a piece of information in this morning's Boston Globe that you wanted to use, in the clock, you just bring it. Yeah, paper, it can play, put it under the camera. Exactly, there completely on the fly. If someone brings something in, or they show me something that's really cool, then I can just show everyone, or how they solve something. Whatever it happens to be, it's it's a great on the fly tool as well. Besides having something. Like that. So this is a tutorial they could use at home when they're doing their homework and they forget what you taught them in the class. That exactly. Day. So they
they can go and look and see. So, yeah. Um, so my goal is, yeah, on yeah. my motor page is to have a file, uh, like my library, basically. Mm. And they can go in the library and they can see, oh, chapter seven, all the different videos they have for that. Oh, I see one for elimination method. And then having uh, their, their friend or a classmate do it, it just mm -hmm. even kind of connects even more. It's not a teacher saying it, it's seeing another student actually create the work. <coughs> so obviously I'll probably have stuff of my own, but right. it's great to create. Having students create the Students work. learning from students and then mm -hmm. also Central. just having each that opportunity to, you know, the visual piece that so many kids and students need. That's yep. how they learn. So when they go home and all of a sudden they open the book, they don't they don't remember how to do it. Yeah, so. and they have it because I mean it's, you always hear the kids every day say, I, I understood it when you were doing it. Exactly. And now I gotta do it myself. And now they have someone to follow along with that they can relate to. So. This is great. It's such an amazing example of technology it's that is enhancing technology. learning yeah, and teaching. It it's, I wish we had this back. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's it's, it's time really for us to go yeah. back to school. Yeah. Yeah. And there's <laughs> even more things that this is capable of that sure. we can't, I, I, even, I can't even do yet. I know there's, um, if you can network it, I can actually connect this hover cam to the classroom's hover cam. So technically, I could show it another classroom across the hall what I'm looking at. But I don't know, our network right now isn't capable of that. But mm -hmm. it's something, there's so many other things that you can do with it. That, you, can know, you can take video in the, in the elementary as you can read a book under it, flip the pages, you can see somebody flip it. So if somebody's at home and doesn't, you know, is home for a few days and they're reading a particular story or whatever, you can do that. Or just take still pictures of all the pages and then it, it, the child can access mm -hmm. it. <clears throat> this seems great if a child that misses school because they're sick or something or uh, out for other reasons, but to be able to go online and, and see a classmate do a problem that kind of grasps something, it's almost as though they didn't miss mm -hmm. that classwork, too, so that's great. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, our any of our administrators want to chime in, but it's used a lot for in the English language art yeah. classroom for writing, so you can look at writing pieces, yeah, and instead of having, I mean, there's no textbook that shows different writing pieces. We can put examples up and say, does this have a strong, you know, topic sentence? Does it have um, an interesting closer? And they can look at different examples and talk about it. So you could just, next time you flip something underneath that, it projects it up on the wall, flip another one up there and talk about it. So it's, it's really helped um, flexibility and facilitation of the learning environment. That's why this example is great. Thank you. And when you think about it, the old technology was the overheads. Yeah, yeah which, that's what I was just thinking. Which, which a teacher had to plan in advance because you had to make yes. a copy of something to be able to put it down. The cost course. of the overhead, yeah, the, the oh, cost yeah. of the overhead itself was probably uh, two to three times the cost of this this unit itself. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is a lot more mobile than. And you had to buy the care. little overhead <laughs> transparency. Oh yes, yeah. wipe them off. Yeah. Well, um, right, yeah. they had to be just yeah. right on the. Right on. Exactly. Yeah. And it has, it has the microphone here, so you hear them talking. Well, right. I, I can yes. zoom in and focus amazing. my little thing here. That changes it. And they're portable. Um, they're very portable. The plug and play. I brought it home just to make sure everything was working. Yeah. Um, so it, it does work great. And so and yeah, obviously, it plugs into anything, really. It's pretty and simple. how much? Martha, you had a question? No, just a, a comment. You know, by showcasing things like this, it, it lends credibility to what we're trying to do with press, the technology and how important it is for us to keep growing and, and adding things that we're going to the students. Uh, something like this is tremendous yeah. to show this, them. Was this pretty easy for you to learn how to how to use yourself as the teacher? Overall, I'm the, pretty tech savvy, so okay. it is pretty user friendly. Um, a lot of the you know the video stuff you can read through the help section and get through it pretty easily, um, as long as everything's working properly. Um, yeah, the, the scanning is pretty easy. Uh, again, the network stuff I haven't figured out yet, mm -hmm. but. Um, the, the basic, well, the easiest thing is you can just click something and there you go. It is a fancy projector. Yeah. All right. It just has all the other bells and whistles, too, to it. And it's very inexpensive compared to other, you know, video documents out there, like Elmo mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, it's only runs about 250 okay, which is pretty And good. we have about how many throughout the system? Uh, we have a few in each building, but uh, most of them have been purchased, uh, some of them purchased by us, but some by FACES. So if you remember the most recent mm -hmm. FACES grants, it was a cluster. Uh, purchased to be shared at the Borough School um, and the cluster at the Ahern. Yeah, that Europe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're trying to add them here and there when we can. So there are a few in each school There's anyway. There's a few in each okay. school. But it's by no means like a widespread, you can find mm -hmm. them in every classroom yet, but that would be a great goal because it is, it, I would, it, I don't know if I call it high tech, I call, call it medium tech. Uh -huh. But it, it's one of the best teaching 
into technology teaching tools we've come across because it is really simple. But if you think about the number of uses, it's amazing. Even you know, even in science experiments, if you want everybody to see one thing that's going on, say in a microscope, you know, or or on a microscope slide, you can just put it under there, and everybody can see it as large as that. So you don't have to one by one try to get in and look and see what's happening on the slide. You just put it under there, and everybody can see it. Yeah, yeah. I was I was doing a measurement with my seventh graders. And I was able to just put the ruler and talk about breaking up the ruler. So it's really hard to take a little ruler like this and have everyone able to see it. So this is a great way of just, you know, so many different things that you can't even think of. Yeah. I'm just popping it up there. Math yeah. manipulatives, like in the younger grades, the teacher just mm -hmm. manipulates it that, and the kids can watch it you know, happening and then just recreate it themselves. There's just so many different uses for it. It's mind boggling. Right. Yeah, the video actually rendered. So. <laughs> the video was fabulous. Exactly. I've never seen anyone use that for a video yet. So. Good job. It's wonderful. Excellent. Very good Excellent job. Excellent job. Really good. Yeah. So the video is there. It, it actually it picks up the voice. I don't know how well you can hear it. Yeah, it's pretty low. It's coming out of here. But uh, um, you literally see him go, amazing. and then everything would play, and you would mm -hmm. literally see her do her thing. And so right now she's just reading it. But um, that's amazing. It is amazing. I, I really think it is. I think it's definitely going to be um, what we're all going to be leaning yeah, towards trying to do. Yeah. It, 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 it does take some time, it takes a lot of effort to put it all together, but I think it's worth it in the end, especially if you, even if you create a couple every year or every unit, it's just going to build and you have multiple different versions. So hopefully next year I have another student to do an elimination problem, so now they're going to have multiple ways to see it. The nice thing about being able to do the videos, it ties in nicely to the flip classroom model we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So if kids can want to review a concept that they might need to see again, or it, they can watch it for homework and come in and be prepared with questions about what they just saw. So either way. Okay. Well, excellent. That is our nice little presentation. So hopefully you enjoyed it. <coughs> Thank it. you. Very education. Thank, Thank you, Bella. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. You did a fabulous job. Okay, do you want to maybe introduce our next uh, item, Elementary Reading Special Education Service Model Review with Dr. Barrows, um, Dr. Grubert, and Ms. Caselli. Great. Um, while they're getting ready, um, as you remember, we have a, a six-year curriculum review cycle. So last year was our year, we call it the bump year informally, but it was the year where we weren't reviewing a major area like ELA, math, science, social studies. So it's the year that we can sort of tailor what, what, it, what is it that we want to investigate a little bit more and have a curriculum review team looking at something other than a particular content area. So last year we decided that we wanted to look at our service delivery model for reading and, el and elementary reading and special ed support services. So. Um, as you said, um, Dr. Bertos, Dr. Gruber, and Diane Casilli are the three that um, tri-chaired, I will say, the, the group Tri -chair. um, to look at it. And um, they're here to give you their report. So, uh, it did go on into this year. That's why we're not here that much. It actually took into half of the school year as well. So. All right, so we have a few slides here that we wanted to give you the overview. And as Debbie had said, that this was the internal program review that we determined that really was an area of need. And it was based on the ELA curriculum review. It was based on the RTI committee. And all of the data that we've looked at, and really the coaching course, the data coaching course that so many of us took, it really pointed more to questions that we were asking through that data analysis process using that protocol. The questions that were surfacing helped us really define the area that we wanted to study. And that's what brought us to certain pieces of quantitative and qualitative data in the district as well as research. So we looked at the data from here, right here in Foxborough, as far as our current service delivery. We looked at our models of practice, what was taking place with our reading specialists that were providing supplemental service and reading, as well as our special educators. We looked at the collaborative opportunities that were in place currently within each of the three elementaries meaning how often did reading specialists have the opportunity to plan or talk with classroom teachers or special educators, especially those for when they shared students, if we had a special educator working with students that maybe a reading specialist might be working with or vice versa. We looked at all of the data that we had, whether it was from that ELA curriculum review 
the many assessments you've heard about from our baselines and benchmarks report in the fall, looking at that information, and then looking at current research in the field as far as what's best practice and service delivery in order to really meet our most at-risk students the best way that we can and what are those models that support literacy instruction. In November, on the professional development day that we had, we shared all of this work with the full staff at Off Rebuildings and um, from then we've started really kind of diving into some of the recommendations that have come out of this. The administration that was involved, you'll see here that the three of us and then Mrs. McCarthy as well, we did have the other elementary principals pop in when they could, but she was, we wanted to have somebody that was the constant. We met twice a month from March through the fall, but all of them really had a hand in this because we're just so fortunate that everyone is so involved and they see that, that this is so important. And then classroom teachers, we had reading specialists, we had special educators, and we had general educators, and then representation from all three of the schools. And the time that was spent, as I said, we met twice a month, um, and those meetings were an hour and a half to two hours after school, and then they had work to do in between the meetings, whether it was reading the research articles that we assigned, or going back and collecting survey data from what was taking place in their building. So it was a, a lot of work during that time span. When we looked at truly what was our goal, we knew that this was an area that we wanted to study more in depth. There were really three focal points um, here. We wanted to look at what was effective and efficient as far as models of practice for supplemental support. We wanted to clarify what our philosophy here in Foxborough is, meaning looking at students and servicing students in the classroom or outside of the classroom and make sure that what we believed in is what we are communicating to everyone and it is consistent and then also design a model that's based on those beliefs. And in those discussions, as part of that, it brought us to a number of questions that really guided our work. So, in our initial discussions, we came up with several questions. Uh, one was, we wanted to really look closely at where services were being provided for students and why. And in looking at that, we found there are times when services are provided outside the general education classroom, in particular when a student has that recommendation on their IEP, they may go out of the classroom for some of their instruction. We also found that there were times when services were being provided outside the classroom by a reading specialist to either find a quieter area or an area that had the physical space set up for a small group. And also there was, we also saw that services of course are being provided in the classroom. In addition to the general education teacher teaching in the classroom, we have services being delivered in the general education classroom by both reading specialists sometimes and by special educators. We also found from our work um, in looking at our current practices about where services are being delivered and in reading several research articles that it really supports a model where all service providers, reading specialists, special educators, and classroom teachers are sharing an integrated service approach in the classroom. That is, we, run, we really want to see students receiving the bulk of their reading instruction in the general ed education classroom as much as possible, as opposed to being pulled out of the classroom. Another question we had was, what is the right balance between co-teaching in the classroom and small group work? And that was really having the discussion of um, there are times when a reading specialist has expertise that they bring to the classroom and they may co-teach with the classroom teacher and then there's also times when it's definitely important for them to work with small group. So having the conversation about what is the right amount between the small group instruction versus some of that whole class instruction that takes place and deciding for us looking at our literacy block schedule and seeing you know what's best with what the time that we have. When we looked at when sub supplemental scheduled pullout instruction was being provided and when that was appropriate, we found that for students on IEPs, as I said earlier, it was appropriate in certain circumstances to have small group instruction outside the classroom. 
but we really wanted to clarify our expectations that as much of the instruction as possible be delivered in the classroom with a co-teach model among all service providers so that special educators are working in a classroom, reading specialists are working in a classroom, and there's a lot of small group instruction going on at one time, and the teachers who are all providing this instruction can collaborate with each other based on their instructional approaches, but also on student needs. We looked at, we wanted to look at how our data was being used to inform instruction and make decisions. And we found by looking at the data that both general educators were collecting and special educators were collecting, we have a lot of data. Um, we use a lot of different assessments, whether it be informal assessments or formal, formal assessments, and we want to make sure that we're using that data to drive our decisions about our instruction and how we are forming groups for student instruction. We also asked about class placement and how that supports the model. And class placement is really important because you have special educators and reading specialists who are teaching across several grade levels. So when students are in small groups for a portion of their instruction, it's really important to have them in classes where the special educator or the reading specialist can get to students who have like needs and need similar instruction instead of having to do that instruction across several different classrooms several different times. And the, the biggest question driving our work is how are we using our available resources to support the model? We really wanted to look at are we making the best use of our human resources in terms of the expertise of the classroom teacher, the expertise of the reading specialist, and the expertise of the special educator so that we can provide um, the optimal literacy instruction for students and at the same time maximize our resources. We found that there are certainly benefits of a shared service delivery model. And one is that a team approach is really wonderful for students and teachers because the stu students see all providers as their teacher when the reading specialist is in the classroom, when the special educator is in the classroom, and the classroom teacher, the students learn that these are all, these are all my teachers. Um, it also creates a sense of community. It really sends a message that we appreciate everybody's differences um, and abilities. And it, and it also creates social benefits for kids. It's very hard to be pulled out of a classroom and then come back into instruction that's already going on it makes transitions much easier when the instruction is going on in the classroom for everyone. We also found that when you have a coordinated integrated service delivery model with everyone teaching in the classroom, collaboration is promoted because colleagues are working together right in the classroom and they can collaborate on the spot as well as collaborate outside the instructional time frame. And an inclusive model and a shared service delivery model also really capitalizes on the expertise of our staff. You know, we have people with different training in different areas, and when we have the staff all working together, it really does help us use our resources to the best of our ability and support each other. <clears throat> so although there are many benefits, we did find there are some challenges. Um, and collaboration is key and it's sometimes difficult to find the time because of the scheduling for our teachers to be able to collaborate. Um, we have reading specialists who work across multiple grade levels um, and we have to work around the classroom specials and lunches so sometimes it gets tricky to find the time during the school day for them to be able to collaborate. So that's one of the challenges we have to keep in mind and try to address as we move forward. Um, and clarifying instructional res responsibilities is another challenge. We need to have the collaboration so teachers can talk about who's responsible for which piece of the instruction. Um, and so that when a child's working with the reading specialist in a small group, the classroom teacher knows exactly what they're working on so that when the child folds back into the classroom or into a small group with the teacher, we're not duplicating the instruction, that we're making sure that we're hitting all aspects of what the child needs. Um, coordination of common planning times, that goes back to our collaboration piece really making sure that we 
try to have those times when the reading specialist or the special educator and the classroom teacher can sit down together and talk about the instruction that's taking place and how they're going to approach um, what's the instruction that will take place. And then it just it helps to build for consistent and ongoing communication. Um, like Arlene said that sometimes some of it takes place right in the classroom, but they need to have time when they can really sit down and plan uh, moving forward. So some of our recommendations. We want to look at the supplemental service schedules so that we can maximize the service delivery between classrooms and grade levels in each building. Meaning we want to look at special educator schedules, reading <coughs> specialist schedules, and be able to really maximi maximize the resources so that we can meet the needs of our students in the best way possible. Um, we also want to be sure that we are taking students out of the classroom as little as possible because we know from the work that we did and the research that we read, um, students really do better when they're in the general education classroom. We also want to look at our schedules in terms of maximizing the time available for staff, reading teachers, special educators, and classroom teachers to collaborate with each other because that is really key to making an integrated service delivery model really work well. Arlene, excuse me, are these, are, are these things we don't do currently? <coughs> no, there are things that we do, but we wanted to really take a closer look and see how much <coughs> we're doing, like how much are students going out of the classroom, is it consistent across the, all three schools, um, can we promote more in-class instruction among you know, the reading specialists, the special educators, and the classroom teachers. So we are doing it, but we want to make sure that we're doing it to the best of our ability. I think many times we, you know, in the classroom with, with lessons that teachers teach, you want to reflect and think how did that go and refine the practices to make it better the next time. So really taking a hard look at what we do, and looking mm -hmm. to see what we do really well, and then see are there areas for improvement. And that's essentially you know, what we found out. We can maximize time for collaboration in different ways. Look at the scheduling to, to really make it where it's more cohesive so that that supplemental, where we're giving that double dose to students that need it most, that we're going to do it as efficiently um, as we can so it's the most effective for their learning. Now, I also think that as a result of the, the work this group <coughs> did, we had time as a group to read a lot of the current research and discuss that research and it backed up our beliefs that we sh you know this is the best model for students as a result of some of these recommendations are the is the schedule going to be changing in terms of this collaboration in trying to find this time because i i know that the teachers have talked about this in the past that that's that's a challenge just across, right, for, for teachers to have time to collaborate. So in this more individualized way where you're having multiple teachers sometimes in the classroom, um, just wondering, is that something that you're looking to do in a couple of months, or are you trying to work on that right now? I'm just kind of... Both. Some things were as simple as learning from one building how they find time for collaboration. Mm -hmm. That is the 15 minutes before the recess. Um, or the lunch period mm -hmm. and it's really kind of thinking outside of the box of where can we grab minutes mm -hmm. instead of taking that five minutes at the beginning of a class when a teacher is checking in with the classroom teachers. What are better ways that maybe we didn't think about that's a great time to grab 10 minutes to kind of see that everybody is on the same page as far as the delivery of instruction on that day. The other piece as far as more collaboration which you may remember that came out as a uh, recommendation from the ELA curriculum review too. So we have time after school where teachers have a staff meeting or they have a grade level meeting. But what we're doing right now to answer your question is looking at how can we provide time during the school day through a professional learning community model where teachers are really getting together and what is it that we expect kids to know and to be able to do? How do we know that they can do it? And when they can, what are we doing about it? Meaning if they need reinforcement or if they need enrichment. And really using, as Arlene was, and Diane were saying, we have a lot of data. And there's that saying to be, 
data rich and information poor. We want to make sure that all of the great data that we have, that we are using it effectively to truly meet needs. So one of the ways that we've started, and we just launched this um, in March, and that was with staff meetings to really come back to what are the core beliefs as far as with professional learning communities, and then building in a 75 minute time period once a month where teachers by grade level come together during the school day and it, and it rotates. So there would be uh, substitute coverage in the classroom once a month for 75 <coughs> minutes and the teachers come together, they look at that data and then make plans really based on the information that they have. You just started that in March? In yeah. March. And that's, it, again, it, it really takes, how can we make this work to where it's the greatest impact on students and we're not taking anything from them, we're just putting in gains. Amy, typically, if you take a, a student out of a classroom, what are you actually helping them with or where, where are the concerns? It, it could be many different things. It, it could be... Um, I mean, where, where do you think most of our effort needs to go? Is it just reading skills or comprehension or vocabulary or all of it? All of it. Okay. You could have a small group that really you're working on decoding and encoding skills. Mm -hmm. And you could have a group that really they've got that piece they can read beautifully but they don't have the comprehension. Yeah. So what are the comprehension strategies that we're working? So we want to make sure that when we're looking at those different flexible groups of students that we're, we're meeting those students' needs and that if you have somebody that really needs comprehension versus someone that really needs work on decoding and building fluency, that we have them in a flexible group together. And that's what we mean when we're talking about kind of maximizing our resources and looking at not duplicating efforts. If I'm working with a group on word work or sight words that I'm able to do that in a supplemental fashion and then the teacher is building on that but we're not doing the same thing twice that we're really trying to give as much to those groups depending on what their needs are. Do you find similar problems at certain grade levels or is it just all over the map? I think in, I mean, it's you really talk based on the students needs right. so in each classroom there's a range of of abilities and needs based on where the students are. So you may have a group of some students who need fluency and some who may need extra help with decoding. Um, so it's really based on what the students need at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And our assessment helps to inform our instruction to really see what students but need. But do you see any pattern or anything that, you know, did we miss doing this at grade one or, you know, where did how did this all begin? And I think one of the areas is that, that came up in the ELA review and it came up in this review too is when we look at some, and it's only one piece, mm -hmm. and that's phonics instruction and having a more systematic um, phonics piece there because when you have a core program, that's all of those areas. I mean, it all builds to comprehension, which is the most important. But we found that we needed to have a more systematic approach to phonics. So how can we do that in what we call a tier one to the whole class and the beginning of the instruction. So when we talk about scheduling as an example, if we're doing a, a lesson that has to do with phonics at the beginning, we want everyone to have that. So the last thing we want is for a student to be pulled you know, even if it's in the classroom in a small group and miss that core instruction. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. Looking at that literacy block as a whole, looking at those untouchable moments within the classroom so that all students have those pieces and that when we're pulling them in flexible groups, then they're getting what they need within those small groups. I, I want to be clear that when they're talking about flexible groups and meeting kids' needs, they don't necessarily mean out of the classroom. In most cases, they don't mean out of the classroom. No, That's yeah. the whole, you know, so we, we pull kids out very infrequently and because they have a really particular need, it could be for a language-based approach to reading because they have a disability that speaks to that. So it, all of these, this is what good literacy instruction should look like, is being able to flexibly meet kids' needs, whether it's vocabulary, whether it's fluency, whether it's comprehension, but not necessarily out of the classroom. We're, we're advocating going back to a more um, in-class model for the, mo for the vast majority of students to make sure that we're not just pulling them out because it's more convenient or we think it's quieter or whatever. That, that the more they can stay in the general instruction, the better, but as adults, we can work together to meet those needs collaboratively working in an inclusive setting. You know, when, when you look at over a period of time and how certain things have evolved, I mean, we have students that were great sight readers. We have children who 
unless you did something phonetically, they would never learn how to read. So I think it's, you know, it's like you have to always go back to, to square one and, and figure out which, what are the needs of each child, and I, I think you do that beautifully. And I think that's what's so important is that you don't, you don't pigeonhole everybody in the first grade is going to be phonetic or anybody. Every child has a different learning style, and I think unless we can key in on that, we're not going to get where we need to go because no two children are going to learn the same way. I had five kids, and no two of them were alike. And I, I think that's probably the hardest thing for us to understand as parents, as educators, or anybody who's in the field, is that there's no right or wrong way. It's trying to find the way for each individual child. And I, I think that's really what you've done. You do a job, and I, I yeah. won't plug for Diane Casilli under her leadership. We have, we have assessments for all those components yeah. of literacy. And what, we're, what they were trying to work on studying is we have a lot of information about kids. She's got a complete literacy assessment model mm -hmm. um, for all grade levels, for all components of literacy. What do we do with that information? And now this, this team's studied how do we best deliver services to them based on what we know. You know, not just assuming we, we know a lot, so what we're delivering is, you know, the best we can do. So we, they were looking at how do we then provide services mm -hmm. for kids and where and why. Very helpful. It seems very innovative too, in terms of really well, looking. Well, it seems innovative, but I it, it, everything kind of goes around again. Yeah. When I was a, a, a reading specialist, I didn't work outside the classroom at all. I worked mm -hmm. all in classes mm -hmm. the, all the years that I was here, completely inclusive in class model, mm -hmm. co-teaching with teachers, and then. For a while, a while ago, sometimes you know, you're paying attention to other things. You maybe get away from it a little bit, or you know, there are other competing interests, and you sort of fly away. So that's one of the reasons why they wanted to study it again. What does the research say? And it went back to you know. So it, it's it's not that we went completely away from it. It's not like a pendulum. But sometimes you get away a little bit, and then you look at the research again, and you clarify: Is that still the best way to go? Yes, it is. What are we doing? And and just to be purposeful, I think is their point. So if we are taking a student outside of their regular classroom for supplementary instruction or reteaching or whatever, that we know why we're doing it. Because it's that, in that case, it's the right thing to do because it's based on that child's needs. Not because I, as the adult, prefer to work out in my own little spot because I don't want to co-plan with somebody or because there are just too many kids or we haven't done a good job placing them. You know, so we want to make sure that when we do it, because some kids do need that, that we know why we're doing it. We try to be more purposeful. And if we're not removing them from the classroom, why we know why we're not and we know what they need and who's going to provide it and how we're going to work together. Well, so. actually, that's what I was referring to, yeah. is just looking at the process as being the innovation. Like, right. exactly, not necessarily the inclusion, but, but what you're saying, really looking at why and how to be more mm -hmm. efficient. You know, just again, trying to do what you do even better than how you do it. <laughs> I just think this is an example of the best kind of study because you're saying, why do we do what we do? Right. And is that the right thing to do? And or is it the what, best way? What way? Mm -hmm. Or is it the best way? And I think sometimes, especially in this day, there's so much to do, you don't often pause to say, why, why are we doing it that way? And so when we came, when they came up with this idea, we were talking about it together because we some of us weren't clear on do we have we gotten away because we've done so much with math and science that sometimes in the last few years you're trying to have as much conversation as you can about everything. But if you spend several years having a lot of conversation about math and science, just by just logistically, you're having less about literacy because you only have so much time. So we we do revisit things and, and ask ourselves why why are we doing what we're doing and can we do it better. And the mm -hmm. fact that it included both special ed and regular ed reading support services is, was really a gift because all kids are all of our kids. Well, isn't it true that all of the students in the classroom benefit from the inclusive classroom because yes. there are fewer interruptions and breaks mm -hmm. in the classroom setting so that every student benefits from a, a, a flow in an inclusive classroom, for lack of a better uh, Students of all abilities. Students of all abilities, mm -hmm. yes, that's what I meant. Exactly. Yeah, but ironically, if we don't build this foundation, no child can grow. Right. Because if you can't read, if you can't comprehend, if you can't explore, you're never going to be able to um, do the best you can in all the subjects. So if we don't build the most solid foundation we possibly can, these children are lost. So 
to go back to our recommendations. One of our <coughs> recommendations is to revisit the resources available to support tiered instruction and interventions. So that's both our human resources and to look at the actual instructional materials that we're using as well. Um, we want to capitalize and utilize the expertise of our reading special education staff through collaboration and scheduling to make sure we're not duplicating efforts and services in the classroom. And we want to continue with our to provide ongoing sustained professional development in the areas of balanced literacy. So as um, Ms. Spinelli was saying, that we want to go back and revisit. We know we've done a lot with balanced literacy and guided reading, but we need to go back and regroup to make sure that, um, the, that we're still including all of these approaches. Um, so the guided reading, literacy stations, the phonics, special, uh, spelling, specialized instruction, and visual instruction. We also want to revisit the RTI model and the roles and responsibilities within, within each tier. So that the idea of the core classroom instruction, what's taking place then, making sure that we're leaving that whole and not interrupting for our, to provide our supplemental services there, and ensure that all staff understands and implements our district philosophy and the approach to supplemental service delivery. And speaking to what we were just talking about a little earlier, we want to provide suggestions and have a lot of clarity around when pull-out instruction is appropriate so that students are in the classroom. And we want to be sure to look at our groups, look at our group size, the duration of instruction, the frequency of instruction, and make sure we consider the data and the groupings in terms of placement and student needs. So our next step is to examine current literacy blocks and scheduling. We looked at many sample schedules to help us get an idea of what might be the best model for us, so having some more conversations around how can we make that work for us here. Um, promote, we want to promote collaboration time among classroom teachers and specialists, so the idea is of how we shared, you know, where it's working well, how did you make time for collaboration, and how can we can replicate that in other places. Revisit the balanced literacy approach and provide professional development in guided reading and systematic phonics instruction. Um, ensure that all staff understands and implements the district's philosophy and approach to supplemental service delivery. And this is lengthy, but if you said, well, then what is the philosophy? It goes back to what you said, an inclusive model. That, that is what we believe is best and research supports it. So um, that, that we know that all children do learn best when the majority of their instructions in the general education classroom and that the pull-out instruction, as uh, Arlene was saying, that it's going to be based on students and their individual education plans who have that designated by their IEP team, and that it is supplemental and it does not take place of the general education um, instruction that's taking place, and that the majority of a student's reading instruction is in the general education classroom, <coughs> participating with everyone within that uh, general education curriculum with the general <coughs> education teacher and that our reading specialists and our special educators they are the providers for supplemental instruction and that their place is, is there to support and to supplement and that can be through small group it can be through some of those model lessons that we were talking about through co-teaching but it's taking place within the general education classroom and just to add it that's not enough obviously it's not based on student needs so I'd give them a lot of credit for being so thorough in this study but it's based on student needs but the reality is when we don't stay in our silos and we get out and work together really truly work together we all get better the bag of tricks gets shared and uh, you know something a special educator might know that I might not know as a general ed teacher or whatever you know if we don't stay in our silos we get better and then we do better by children Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you John. for your work. Thank you very much. And Dr. Kruber does she stay right where she is. <coughs> so this is part of your school committee you know, district goals that you set in the retreat every summer. And um, annually, you like an update on special education. In the last couple of years, what we've really done, instead of just sort of reviewing every year what we offer for special ed, if you remember last year, we started with some of a, what's new in special ed? What's something you might not know about in special education that we would want to highlight? And this year, um, Arlene decided to go with a, a different little approach to presentation, which I applaud her for. So. Since this is something we're all trying to be as administrators better models for technology use, so yes, 
I challenged myself this year with a new presentation format, so let's see how it works. <laughs> you um, Trust me. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, our reading and special education program report is a perfect segue into the presentation that I put together tonight because I wanted to show you um, a visual tour around the system of the specific services and some of the programs that we're providing for students. And as we spoke about already, we really believe in an inclusion philosophy and that all students, regardless of their abilities and challenges, can learn, thrive, and be educated in their home school community with the appropriate supports and services. So inclusion means different things for different students. And if a student spends 21% or less of the school week outside the general education classroom, they're considered as having a full inclusion program. Some students need more than that and they spend more than 21% but less than 60% out of the general education classroom and they're considered as having a partial inclusion program. And we still have other students who require more than 60% of the time out of the general education classroom, but their, their school programs are still inclusive because their programs are in their community school. They participate to the extent that they're able to in mainstream classes and activities, and especially the life of the school. So we start at the preschool when students are first found eligible for special education at age three. And we have both inclusive classrooms where students at age three and four are learning alongside their typically developing peers. We also have a classroom that's substantially separate for students with more intense needs. Our work is multi-sensory, hands-on, and we're really focusing a lot on language development because students who are found el eligible at that young age often need support in the area of language development and we're building those foundational skills that they'll need when they go off to kindergarten. We also work on the development of course of their social emotional skills, their physical skills, and their cognitive development. At the elementary level, one of our specialized programs at the IGO school is called the Alternative Developmental Learning Program. And in this program, we provide a very specialized type of instruction, teaching methodology called Applied Behavioral Analysis. And this, this approach to teaching is considered best practice. Um, it's research-based for some students on the autism spectrum. And ABA engages students in learning by consistent prompts and consistent feedback. And it involves some very intensive data collection, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this slide. You can see the teacher has all her teaching materials. And she's actually collecting data across three data sheets. <coughs> she's collecting data about the student's response to the academic instruction. And she's also collecting data on the two other sheets related to goals the student ha may have in behavior. So for example, at every one minute interval, she's recording how a student is demonstrating on task behavior. So discrete trial is a form of instruction within an ABA approach. And it involves this very intensive data collection, as you can see on this sheet. Our staff have been trained to teach using an ABA approach. We have several staff, both educational assistants and teachers, who have gone through a specialized training program so that they are actually certified in ABA. Another program we have at the elementary level is called our team-based learning program. And as you can see in this program, we want to help students learn how to make good choices. It's a program that focuses on helping, helping students regulate their emotions and their behavior. And this is an area in the TBL classroom where they can cool down if they need to, take a break, and work through a process around making good decisions. So what is the decision I have to make? What are my choices? What can happen with each of these choices? And which is the better choice? 
We're using a lot of technology. And at the Taylor <coughs> School, we have a program for students with specific learning disabilities in reading, writing, some students in math, and students with receptive and expressive language disorders. And as an extension of last year's iPad project, we're using more iPads to bring access and participation to students so that they can read the same text as their grade level peers. And what you see here are some students are accessing the iPad, they're reading the same literature as their grade level peers, and on the iPad they use an app called read to go and we download books from a, a website called Bookshare.org. And Bookshare.org, we can download books at no cost into read to go for students with print disabilities. So this has been a very exciting addition to our program. Um, the iPad affords students, you know, the speech to text so they can hear, hear the text and see it. It affords um, a student with a visual imp impairment can adjust the font size. And it gives them some sense of independence because they're actually reading the book. Um, same book, holding the iPad in their hands. That's We're using exciting. other technology. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Learning Ally, but that used to be the recordings for the blind and dyslexics. Mm -hmm. And we had to order CDs and then play them on a specialized machine. And now we can access audio files through Learning Ally, and those audio files can be downloaded to a personal computer, a Mac, an iPhone, an iTouch, an MP3 player, literally any textbook or any novel. And the students can have access to the audio file while reading their book. They can also have access to Learning Ally at home from their home computers. So a lot of our work is really about providing access and participation to students, giving them a sense of independence, and the new technology that we're using is, is making it a lot easier and a lot more accessible. At the Ahern Middle School, we have an alternative developmental learning program that follows our elementary program. And there's a student here who wrote a report on the computer, um, put in some pictures, that he accessed from the internet and now he is giving an oral presentation of his report on the in, on an interactive <coughs> whiteboard. There's another student here who's accessing the iPad as a functional functional communication tool and she's using it in speech and language therapy and the iPad is just a it's an incredible tool for students who have limited language and this student is responding to her teacher the speech pathologist, the speech actually, that's a SLP assistant. She's responding to um, a prompt of what is the student doing and she's typing into an app called Speak It and she's typing the boy is playing soccer and then she can tap the iPad and it'll read her sentence and she's actually um, beginning to speak more herself. At the Ahern, we also have a team program that follows our team program at the elementary level. And we're, we're focusing on teaching students social thinking skills. We're focusing on helping them identify their own feelings and also supporting them with academics as needed. And both the team program at the elementary level and the middle school level use a curriculum called the Zones of Regulation. This is not a behavior program. It's a curriculum that teaches students how to identify their own feelings. And we want students to learn how to identify their feelings, what zone they're in, so that they can access strategies and self-regulate their emotions and their behavior. And we have our PAVE program at the high school. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. It's our partnership for academic and vocational experiences. And we service students in grade nine up through age 22. And our students are participating in mainstream activities based on their interests. So we have students who are interested in chorus and they're participating in chorus. We have students who are interested in taking ASL and they're participating in that as a mainstream course. We have a student um, at a job site here who's actually learning how to make an eyeglass kit. 
and then we have a student who is helping at Sunlight Farms right here in Foxborough, assisting with holiday decorations. We're supporting students with community access teaching them independence, responsibility, and again, that whole sense of being part of the community and learning skills that they need to learn for when they leave school. Um, this is some pictures of them at the Y, but they do many other things in the community. They go to the library, they, go, they learn how to go shopping, they go to restaurants. Here are some more um, pictures from different job sites. We have a student helping out at Sunlight Farms in the springtime with the nursery. And then we have, we actually have some students who are learning job skills right here in Foxborough. We have an educational assistant up there in the top, top left-hand corner who is supporting two students um, working in the Borough School cafeteria. Quite and there's another. Of jobs mm -hmm. available. Yes. We have a student learning um, job skills at a bottle redemption center. <clears throat> Our goal is to make students as independent as possible and prepare them for career and college and life after high school. So how are we doing with inclusion district-wide? 65% of our students on IEPs have full inclusion programs, 21% have partial inclusion, and 14% have substantially separate programs. We have some students who require out-of-district placements, but because we have services and we're supporting quality programming, we can meet the needs of many students with differing, different and unique, you know, unique abilities right here in district. So we have a downward trend, actually, since 2008. 2008 of, um, in our need for out-of-district placements. Here's one last slide that I wanted to share with you. It's a picture of a student working in our school store, um, running the cash register, and he is actually here tonight. And he does a very good job. He, he was telling me that, you know, he sells healthy snacks, t-shirts and sweatshirts, he really likes working in the school store, and I can tell you he does a very good job. Who is that? Who is that? That's a desirable that's Mr. job. Joey. Oh, <laughs> Jojo. That, that's a great job working in the school store. Is that a surprise to you? Yeah. Instead of doing the I go, like I decided to do school store because uh, so they decided to do school store since I don't know, you know, like. When you get to the age of three to five, you participate in a more appropriate activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're 14 or younger, then you have a student course and study. Then when you're 16 and older, you can do all the vocational stuff. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And you're pretty good with math and money. If you weren't, <laughs> if you <laughs> weren't, you wouldn't be working in there. So. <laughs> and he does a great job. And he tells me that he likes it. I yeah. really like working in the school store. Yes, and I know they used to sell all the Hoodsy Sunday cups and the chocolate eat care and the strawberry eat care, but they got rid of those because they weren't healthy. Right. Oh, New federal yeah. food guidelines. Yeah, they used Put to the sell old Gatorade, on the they got rid of those in September of 2010. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Gatorade. Then they used to the Gatorade wine. buttons? That's right, Joe. Then they Gatorade got rid of them. Yeah. That is a so great that's job my to visual have tour. School, though, because there's so many retail awesome. stores and you know, so many I've been that would be. taking pictures and also staff have sent me a lot of pictures um, over the course of this year with my iPad, which kind of makes it a bit easier to, you know, put something like this together. And I guess my, my try at a new technology worked pretty well. It is yeah, excellent. Tour. Thank, Thank you. you. I used it on opening day and it went fine. Yes. So I'm saying just try it. What's the worst that could happen? And I did. And you did? And I did. Yeah. No? Any questions? Yes, Bruce. Uh, Arlene, is there anything you need from us? Well, just your continued support for the programs in special mm -hmm. education, which I feel that I've always had. Um, Are the parents you're working with asking for anything that the district isn't providing? I think we're doing a really good job in that regard. I mean, the technology is really important for students, mm -hmm. particularly students with disabilities and high incident 
disabilities, students with specific learning disabilities or any student who has a print disability, we really want to make that access available. So the more technology, technology that we have in the system, and when we're using technology in a classroom and everybody's using it, we're finding these tools are good for everyone. Mm. So the more technology support, which we've talked about, um, but I feel that, that everyone's been very supportive. We've gone from a pilot project with seven iPads last year to we have about 24 out there now, and we're using them as classroom tools. So the technology is the really big area. Okay. As you know, yeah. you saw yeah. earlier that tonight. That mobile technology specialist, that half hybrid, that, that will really help because it was a specific mm -hmm. population of special education students who were trying to roll out the next round of iPads too. So, you know, I think we're pretty cognizant of that kind of thing, try to be a little bit proactive. So I think that's what you mean by support, is that mm -hmm. sometimes it's just having somebody to support the technologies rather than right. the technology itself becomes more important. Right. Thank okay. You. Thank you. I mean, I think one thing, you know, having watched a lot of things evolve over a period of time, you've been a huge asset to this Thank to you. this district. Your demeanor, your ability to work with parents, it, it speaks volumes. Because I don't think any parent who's in a position who has a child with special needs should have to fight so hard for that student. And I think um, you've brought something exceptional to the school system Thank because you. parents are very in tune with you as you are with them and their students needs and I think that speaks a lot to the fact that we have so many kids that come back into the system mm -hmm. and we can meet their needs now because we're not butting heads and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel we're just trying to make it work and I, I think you are a, a leading cause and I, I thank you for being here because I think you're a huge asset to the system. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate hearing that. Well I, I hear it from parents with, with special needs children and I, I um, I think you're a huge credit to us. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe a couple people sitting behind her in the rows, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we all work together. Yes, Thanks, yes. Folks. We have wonderful staff. Wonderful staff. They're interested. They're always interested in ongoing learning, um, really putting in a lot of time to learn the technology, learn the new teaching methodologies, and really become experts at it, which makes a big difference. We need more iPads. Mm. Be great with me. <laughs> it does take a village, so yeah. yes, it really does. To uh, some of the village people sitting in the audience, <laughs> we very appreciate what they do. Yeah, thank you. Some of the coordinators and special educators, as well, that were really with parents directly sitting there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I like that way of updating special education. Yeah. We're expecting the same or better next year. <laughs> <laughs> Update on capital improvement plan meetings. meeting. Ms. Spinelli and Mr. Yukon. Um, those going to talk to you specifically about where we are with the borough the school feasibility um, in a minute, but just so you know to remind the committee that the CIP request that you approved uh, back in January were brought to the CIP committee at the town level. And as you know, that's the first phase. And then, uh, so we had a meeting a week ago Saturday, and we came back on Friday, actually, um, this year. See that in the back, one of the um, CIP members. So um, the projects that the school committee put forward that passed by the, the first round of the CIP uh, were our computers and our hardware, software, network upgrades, kind of as a whole. The wireless infrastructure build out at the high school two full-size school buses, one minibus, four copier replacements, the Ahern Band keyboarding room replacement, um, school security cameras. We can talk about that a little bit if you'd like to. Um, I, th I thought it might be best if we talk about that in executive session. That's why we put off executive session, so we know where we are with that. And then at some point this spring, I think it'd be great if we put that on as a public agenda item. And what was that doing? The school security cameras. Okay. Right. Uh, because there's more going on with just one item. I mean, uh, okay. Chief O'Leary and Diana Mice Packlin, I just went last Thursday to the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office uh, School Security Task Force, mm -hmm. learn a lot of what's going on currently and how they're supporting schools. So that would be a great update as things start to roll out a little bit more. Um, and the last item was the school and the municipal side put together a proposal for new phones and email system together. Mm -hmm because our communication, our main That's modes of communication are sorely 
right. in need of an upgrade, and, and that passed the first phase as well. And then I'll let the Bill speak to where we are with the borough school. Yes, as you know, uh, last meeting you guys voted to approve uh, moving forward with the statement of interest tomorrow night. I mean, with the selectmen uh, under the MSBA, the two boards need to vote um, just moving forward with presenting the, the statement of interest to the uh, MSBA. So hopefully uh, we'll gain, or, uh, gain their approval tomorrow night. Uh, and then that moves that forward. Um, again, uh, you know, kind of a word of caution, there's, there's typically around 200 uh, applications that will go in, typically only about 40 or so uh, they have funding for. So um, they're obviously measuring our needs against the needs of the other communities. But, um, you know, as they say, it's, it's, it's one of these things to get in front of them. Uh, you may not get it the first time, but at least, you know, you'll have a better chance yeah. the second time. So, um, the reason we put it on the CIP committee's uh, discussion point was again transparency to have it out there. Um, you know, if every the stars aligned, you know, effectively we could be coming back to the town for a fall request. Um, but you know, uh, figuring that you know at least by presenting it now, CIP would have its first uh, view of it and understand what we're trying to to go forward with. Um, you know, again, I think if I had to to guess on it, I would say it's less than a 50-50 shot, but it's still. Uh, something that's sorely needed out in that school. Um, you know, we are on, on borrowed time with the roof, especially. But uh, okay, yeah. yeah, no, no, we have to move forward. So, but it wasn't passed through CIP with the, uh, the number attached to it right now, just for yeah. approval of CIP. So yeah. we have to roll forward and be ready when we can be ready. And there were two other small items that we ran by CIP, right. um, not for funding with the town money, but so that because of the of the um, cost so that it could be approved so that we can go forward if we can. The, uh, the process with CIP, just so you, I, I think you're all familiar with, is basically anything over 25000 that's an asset to the town, they're supposed to at least consider. Um, yeah. It's an interesting article, the way it's written. They don't have to approve it, but they have to consider it uh, <laughs> before you can technically do anything with it. So last year, you know, we, we ran into, uh, we had a little bit of extra money at the end, and, and one of the things we decided that we need to get done because of its condition was the paving around the administrative building and but I had to ask to reconvene the CIP committee to be able to do that to move forward uh, this year we're going to be proactive and you know <coughs> whether we'll have the money or not that's the question but it's, it's we're talking about our own funding um, and one of the issues that I have brought before uh, mem you know members of the board is basically the only building we do not have uh, a generator at is the Taylor it creates a lot of issues relative to uh, safety obviously during a power failure when schools in play but it also um, is an issue for us for food service because that's you know when we do lose power for a day or so we have to actually pull all the food out of there uh, move it to another building um, and then the third component to that obviously is the town using that potentially using that building as a shelter when we do finally get to move forward uh, with the the borough project that will be out of play uh, for that period of time so having this you know school also up to the same level that all the other four are and even, if it, even if it weren't going to be out of play uh, in our conversations with the town, the Taylor's actually a better location because of the nature of how the, the gym and the cafeteria are more open areas mm -hmm. rather than a, a closed up area. Yeah. And so um, the town has interest in having us have the Taylor be the more per, uh, permanent shelter site rather than the borough. So if we can manage to get that last generator, I don't, I don't know why how only one school five doesn't have one. One that would do the, the level that we would need there. Um, with everything in is you know engineering and everything is probably about sixty thousand um, dollars. It would be a gas generator, obviously, uh, natural gas. Uh, to so run that's that definitely in the school's interest and in the town's interest. Mm -hmm. Actually, the town has an emergency management agency, local people. Mm -hmm. Their next meeting is on the twenty sixth of this month, actually. So Bill and would I they ever help contribute to it? Um, right now, they don't. It's it's There's just no your town there. people. There's no, it's, there's no budget. It's the you know it's it's led by people you know in town, fire, awesome. led by uh, fire chief. Okay. So, just to, you know, it's it's definitely something that if this is the way we can help out by, we need a generator anyway because we're losing the food and we have to, yeah. we have had a lot of power outages, but it would also help the town and that's kind of collaborative relationship we have. So, if we do have money, you'll see that's us concert. asking yeah. this committee Absolutely. to use it for a generator for the Taylor School. I, I don't really, Surprise if anybody has one. any institutional memory, that'd be great, but we don't really know why we have generators at four schools and not yeah. the fifth. But, Really think about it doesn't it. make sense, yeah. really. Well, it was interesting because the borough was built about the same time and it was actually in the building. Yeah, right. So it was obviously well, thought of at the time, yeah. but yeah. you know, it's, oh. it's not like it was a new concept. Yeah. So when they got the gas lines installed, they were done to install different. Well, some yes. of the buildings actually run diesel, though, some don't even run gas. So, yeah. 
but if, anyway, the, the other item that we, we put forward is that um, uh, we've been in the past very fortunate to get vehicles through kind of the hand-me-down of other departments. Um, unfortunately, the, the level of what these uh, vehicles are looking like nowadays. Meaning the pickup truck, we'll call it <laughs> the old Michael Leary, the Michael Leary Memorial pickup truck oh, that you yeah. see yeah. now uh, driving around. Michael Leary. You know, I mean, most truck. of the vehicles we have it's are 12, 13 years old. Um, Glenn down at the garage does a great job keeping them on the road, so we're not complaining at all. But, um, and, you know, I really think at this point, again, and this is, you know, it's not high on our list, but it, it's one of those things because it would be over 25000 that I at least thought we'd ask permission for uh, from the, the committee. They agreed and, and you know, approved with the, the concept that if we have the funding, it is something okay. Um, but, again, it wouldn't be my first priority. The generator would be obviously my first priority. Um, would be to buy a new pickup truck, and I would even uh, classify that after talking to um, – uh, Roger um, at the DPW that I would get one with a small plow to the front so that we could assist yeah. around our own buildings mm -hmm. even if it's sidewalks and stuff like that um, you know because it's very hard when they start to do the roads they're they're limited yeah. as to what they can do and if we can even just make a pass across the front uh, during a bad storm and stuff like yeah. that we can we can make things work a little bit better it's not we're not going to be the, you know we're not capable of plowing our own facilities because of the size of them uh, but just to assist uh, you know so if we had that vehicle Truck <laughs> well, yeah, I know Tom well, like, like Bill said, we usually get a hand-me-down truck from the DPW, mm -hmm. and, and they are using those to such a length of life that they actually don't have one to give us that's, that's worth decent. It, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. those are the two kind of add-ons, mm -hmm. and again, just would be our sources. We'd come back to you, um, assuming we have anything in the end. Uh, we can discuss. We should put an ad in the Fox Report to see if anybody wants to donate a used vehicle. To Okay. Don't end all oh, sorts no. of other things. You never know. There is a protection. Like yeah, free. Yeah, like free. Like free. Okay. Questions? Okay. So, as you know, CIP then goes to select it goes to the advisory committee and then to town meeting. Okay. I just I have one question. If we get to the end of the, the school year, budget wise, and if we had money left over, could we keep it in the back of our minds that maybe we should um, use it towards the generator? Well, that's what oh, yeah, the, we that's do. why yeah, we had to pass the CIP. Yeah. Okay. Right. Not not to add more to the CIP list, no. but Just to so have them okay. approve it. So no, that if we do, we'll come up with twenty thirty thousand dollars. I mean, that would be half of it. Well, it would we be. Come out of we would hope to do pickup truck first and then generator. Right. Well, I think generator. No, generator. Generator. Yeah. generator. generator. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Generator. Yeah, so, yeah. <coughs> so if we break down the you can ride the generator. <laughs> <laughs> but to make skateboards. You can put on ride skateboards. What we, you know, what we started last year, um, you know, as we saw money, it, you know, and I had only been here for a short time, but working with Devin, we started creating like our master list um, of mm -hmm. issues that we saw within the district, um, you know, before we got to the end, and we yeah. kept prioritizing that, and, and we working with the working with the other principals and stuff like that as far as the issues. You know, I, I've started that since the beginning of this year. It's, it's like we create the list immediately and we start looking at the things that are priority problems for us. One needs are two different things. That's right. So, need um, the so we, we basically, you know, kind of keep a list at all times. We don't know if we're going to have a penny to spend or if we're, you know, going to be okay to do something. Yeah, but at least if you have something in the back of your mind, it's right. not like you're scrambling right. saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? Exactly. Right. And we've done the research. We know what the costs are. We know, you know, yeah. that type of stuff. And again, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then, right. you know. We still know it's so a it was good that we could get that done rather than have the CIP committee reconvene just to approve projects mm -hmm. that we could possibly fund on our own. This way we're kind of set and ready to go if we can. Mm -hmm. So okay. makes sense. Okay. Okay. Any further questions or comments? FY thirteen monthly budget budget statements to you. Okay. Um, as you'll see in the budget statement at this point, um, many of the larger items under the um, salary sides are really the reallocation of the number that we keep uh, on the budget for uh, lane movements. Um, so obviously they get moved up into the individual schools and they get pulled down from down below, which is the district-wide side. Um, you know, that being said, we have had uh, in, in a couple of the schools uh, maternity leaves uh, that creates money for us because obviously they're now we're paying for a substitute versus a full-time teacher. Um, and that's happened in a couple of the locations. So that's created some excess uh, you know, funding availability right now under the salary side. Um, you know, we've actually done um, a couple flip-flops, as you know, um, 
we moved O'Neill from being an expense item to being into the, the, the um, guidance department salary line. So again, you'll see a flip-flop between the expense and the salary, and we moved the money uh, to go with it. Um, so again, that's a transfer that effectively has to happen to, to basically cover that. Um, but so far, and, and you know, knock on wood, um, as you know, at this point, we're, we're looking at expense items, but we don't get too deep into them yet because uh, you know, the next cool. round of utility bills will really be my final sector. But I will say uh, we've tried some new things this year on, on how we run our heating systems and stuff. And so far, knock on wood, that has paid off. We're, we're running very well um, on our electric bill. It's actually not the gas bill. The gas bill stayed fairly consistent, but we're not running the equipment so hard and the motor so hard, so we're not using as much electricity. And the final sense of the um, changing all the lighting in the hallways here at the high school has made a big difference in our in our utility bills as well. So uh, so we will, we will freeze them up there. I'm, I'm hoping maybe a portion of that generator cost actually will come right out of that uh, electric line. Um, it's kind of an appropriate use of it, if you will, from that perspective. So at this point, um, you know, with all the pluses and minuses relative to, you know, positions moving around, um, you know, we're about 64000 just under $65,000 to the good. Um, I'm not uh, expecting huge changes from this point, but I would expect some in the, like I said, usually in the utility area. Most of our expense lines, as I'm sure you can imagine, are spent early in the year because it's, we're buying all of the books, we're buying all of the, the materials that are needed. We don't obviously wait until the end, but we do keep some in reserve um, just in case something new comes along. Um, so, uh, you know, the majority of the expense lines are, are pretty much spoken for at this time. So you're really going to look at some payroll, you know, hopefully some payroll savings, and you're going to look at some utility savings, and that's uh, similar to last year where we ended up. We had a great year last year with the utilities, obviously, but uh, this hasn't been that winter, so um, not, not expected. Yeah, slightly. So overall, I think it, we're, we're in a pretty good you know, position at this point for the year. I figure it's much. I'm just curious. It seems like there's a lot of like lane changes and there's about seventy to a hundred thousand typically in a year on the yeah. lane changes. And we only budgeted seventy um, this year, but we actually had about a hundred thousand, uh, just under a hundred thousand lane changes. Okay. Um, again, you know, we don't know all of that uh, at the time you're doing the budget last right. December um, because they don't even have to tell us until I believe January. Yeah. So, you know, we're we're kind of guessing it so we under guessed it last year but typically the 70,000 is, is a good number um, to manage it so that that is a uh, you know kind of an unknown so we can't put it into the borough or the Hearn or the I go up front because we don't know which schools are going to happen so ends up being a solution. Do, do, what do we budget for next year? 70? We budget 70 again okay. I think uh, again I think this was a little bit of an abnormal year okay. as far as the overall. I was just curious so. I was noticing it seemed like a lot. Okay. Do you need a motion to accept? Yes. I'll make a motion to accept the budget summary statement. Second. Second. All in favor? Five zero zero. Subcommittee member for bus drivers negotiations, Ms. Yes. Bennett. Yes. Um, within the next couple of weeks, we are about to commence the bus drivers negotiations. So um, it would be lovely to have one school committee member as the liaison to that. If you remember, historically, you don't necessarily, for this um, association, go to every meeting, but to wrap it, to be there to wrap up at the end is, is a great thing. So um, we could have one volunteer for the bus drivers. That would be good. Would you like me to do it? Be great. OK. Sure. Okay. We've already got Bruce and Martha on the teachers and Tina right. on the ed assistants. This I know. That's a big I, negotiation yeah. year. Or I could do it, too. Really. Would you like to? Sure. OK. Why? Go ahead. Okay. Great. Okay. Katie. There'll be another group coming along to us. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to go around. There's 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 lots, lots of groups. Yeah. Well, I'll get, well, I'll get more than one turn. Do you need to take a vote when we do that? Oh, yes. I think so, yeah. Somebody needs to move and I vote. make a motion that. Beyond that. I will second that motion. All in favor? Five zero zero. Other matters? I have a couple. Yes. <laughs> um, first of all, um, we were fortunate enough to receive another donation of furniture from this time uh, GE over in the uh, uh, office park in Foxborough and uh, received a uh, probably about uh, 
30 filing cabinets, um, a computer rack uh, for our new computer room, um, 12 stacking, very nice stacking cloth mm -hmm. chairs, a um, couple tables, two big large drafting tables, like brand new. Uh, most of the equipment was in actually excellent shape, three desks. Um, and they called us basically uh, looking to donate it if we were interested. So we and why why do they need to donate? They were they were reorganizing their own struct their own internal building. Um, a group had moved out. A new group was moving in, and some of the stuff didn't fit with what the, the new group wanted to use. Um, so uh, you know it was uh, it was good. The maintenance uh, you know, team went over with me, and we just kind of took everything that we could and. Uh, uh, so now so we're kind of just, well, it's all in storage right now here at the at the high school and, and uh, part of it in the boiler room, part of it in the uh, computer area. But we'll be Is distributing that out. Where some of those file cabinets in the central office yes, came from? The black. Yes. Yeah. They're a little um, banged up, but they're all black, so I'm happy. Yeah. Um, if you remember it's last a, spring, um, Bill and Mike and a bunch of other people went up to get a company that was closing in Marlboro, I think Westboro somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Got two truckloads of things mostly we brought here, tables, chairs, um, desks, office, well, office suites, and um, and now this. So if you remember at the time, we were just going to spray paint the file cabinets mm -hmm. black in central mm -hmm. office, but they have a whole bunch of all black, so we're going to go from four or five colors to one or two. Because I don't know if we have enough. We're we're yeah. It's all right, as long as most of them are, you know, one color, it's fine. And uh, so we're actually getting, in, we haven't bought desks, tables, anything for a long time, so. Anybody else knows the company fold and we'll go get your stuff. The <laughs> <laughs> no. um, okay. second thing I have is um, I think Do we need we need to vote on that first? Uh, yes, it would be yes. nice if you could vote. Uh, uh, could I have a I'll make a motion to accept the um, donation? I will second it. Okay. All in favor? Five zero zero. Write a lovely thank you note. The second thing was um, as you know, um, both our food service group and our, our health department have been working together and doing a number of grants. We were successful in getting one at the beginning of the year through the Dairy Council, which is actually what bought us the uh, salad bar um, at the high school, uh, which was a good start. Uh, they have just approved four more, um, and that will give us um, one for the um, Taylor for $3,000, one for the uh, John J. Hearn for $3,869, one for the uh, Burl for $3,288, and one for the Igo at $3,500. Um, obviously, some of the money goes to the health side of it, some of the money goes to the food service side of it. Things like, um, you know, tabletop blenders, immersion blenders, more salad bars. Um, so this will give us the ability to make, you know, smoothies in, in more of the schools, to have salad bars in more of the schools. Um, and really to, you know, again, to continue to enhance on what we're able to offer on the food service side and, and through a grant. So it's kind of nice. It's, awesome. um, you know, somebody else is supporting some of the th initiatives mm -hmm. we're trying to put together. And I, again, I give, uh, you know, Allison uh, a lot of credit for her work with it and, uh, you know, working together with, again, the health department to, to coordinate the whole effort. Um, but, and, and there are other grants out there that they're going to go after as well. Mm -hmm. So they're going to continue that process, which just enhances the whole uh, service delivery. Uh, it's amazing what's out there. You just gotta hunt for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's through the, the checks are surprised. from the Gen Youth Foundation. Gen, like Generation Youth or something. Right. Gen Youth, you can copy it up if you want. But I think if my math is correct, it's a total of fourteen thousand one hundred fifty-seven dollars in grants that yeah. should be shared. The whole intention was to share it between your food service and something yeah. had to have an accompanying partnership initiative in the wellness department Good. at the school. So. It's a great partnership, and uh, they did a lot of work, so good for them. Uh, thank you, Al. I'll second that. And Janelle Erskine, our wellness, yes, Janelle, wellness department head, right. worked with her, so. Yeah. Send them a thank you. Oh, yeah. well, I will. That's Bevy, Martha, Martha, Martha right. motioned, yes. and Tina seconded. Oh, okay. I'm just writing down names. Okay. All in favor? Five, zero, zero. Bill, how fast can we get that online? Um, well, we just got the checks. So they, and their rule is really interesting. You can't order until you have the checks in your hand. Uh, so we can get it, anything in this year? Yes. Oh yeah. Excellent. Oh no, they're 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 already. I'd uh, ask we prioritize getting something to the Ahern pretty quickly. Oh, um, I've yeah. heard heard. You know what we have at the Ahern, so I've heard a little bit of grumbling <laughs> again lately. So right. anything you can do to expedite it. Yeah. Think would no, be, I think uh, uh, well actually, received. 
they already had all the stuff ready to be ordered. Again, just okay. couldn't order until the checks are here. So. That's Thank you. Thank you. Great. I will say my, my son said to me, I need a dollar for a smoothie mm -hmm. this morning. <laughs> sure. <laughs> he loves it. Yeah. I think they'll sell well at the middle school, too. Yeah, I think yeah. they will, too. Can they use their school bucks for their smoothies, or do they oh, need yeah. extra dollars? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking, because I like this my school bucks thing. I don't have to come up with anything. It just charges automatically. So charge those smoothies. <laughs> Great. Good news. Uh, excellent. So a couple of things. Yes. Don't mind. Um, as people probably already heard by now, tomorrow's um, grades <laughs> four, seven, and ten long composition MCAS has been postponed till Monday. This okay. the incoming storm by oh, the Department of Education true. because mm -hmm. the writing prompt is a secret, so it has to be given on the same day at all schools across the state. So if they don't, if they think some schools might be out tomorrow, then they postponed it. We just found that out. Obviously, too. Um, our last day of school is currently Tuesday, <laughs> June 25. Say that with tongue and cheek. I, I don't think we're, we're getting any time of strange today. weather tomorrow. <laughs> just kidding. I don't think I'm, anybody does even forecast. I'm a little tired talking about the weather, but who knows what will happen tomorrow morning. You know, so. you know spring is like two right, days. Right, yeah. Two, two days. days. First <laughs> official day of spring, yes. Yeah. Well, see. Yeah, the worst snowstorm we have was on I did try day. looking up at the sky and crying uncle today, but you really didn't do anything. Um, the Bandorama is a week from Wednesday, March 27th. I want to remind people it's always a fun event. And I don't know if you wanted to talk about Day on the Hill. That's kind of coming up. I wasn't sure. Bandorama is what date again? The 27th, Wednesday. Day on the Hill, we've March gone some of the years. We went last yeah. year. <laughs> some of the years. Sure. Yeah. Well, what's, uh, what's the date on that again? April 30th. The 30th of April. April 30th. Just to keep that's, it in mind. Oh, well, that's election day. It is. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. but that I won't be going today on the hill. <laughs> no, the, uh, they open early and stay open until 8. Isn't so, that nice? So we can we still go in <laughs> and be home in the afternoon. So Plenty of time to vote. So I thought I'd just remind the committee that it's coming up so you can let Wendy know. Um, she'll register you. I think and that's also, you if either Willie mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Megan, you'd like to go on that day. It's the 30th. All right. April. April. Isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Right. Which April will be a 30th. Tuesday. Okay. I was wondering how our two students are doing. Any updates on your lives? Oh, yes. Willie has an exciting one. Uh, I've been accepted to the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So. Wow, well, congratulations. Wait, number one that's, choice. That's well, right. Oh my gosh, congratulations. congratulations. Congratulations, Megan. Um, I applied to six schools, I got accepted to all of them. <gasps> congratulations. Wow. Congratulations. You know I'm so go surprised. Um, I'm <laughs> going to stay local at either Emmanuel or Simmons. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. 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 Oh, how exciting. Wow. Uh, if you guys could get Mrs. Erickson or uh, Miss Allison Johnson working on scholarship for myself and Megan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll all work on it. <laughs> That's, you two are great. What, what great examples of how, what wonderful kids we have in Foxborough. Uh, Congratulations really to both of you. I know. You guys breathing a sigh of relief now that you know, made your decisions? Yeah. And now remember, if you don't do all your grant work right afterwards, maybe you're going to be like, uh, Mrs. Adair and go back and get a master's degree later and once she completed her master's degree she received a promotion. <laughs> so you don't have to do all of your education <laughs> all at once. There's hope. <laughs> yes. So we even have a right. highlight. We have a highlight. School committee highlight. And I have a good question. Um, they're the talent shows Thursday at the high school. Oh. Oh, oh what, what time? time? Oh, I should have Thursday that. night? <laughs> <laughs> During the day? No, Thursday night. Like at 7 maybe? Is, or? That miss, is it that Mr. Do you have to Foxborough? sign up ahead of time for that? Like, do yeah, the students? They've already, like, signed up for it. So. Is that the Mr. Foxborough one? No, no. it's a talent show. No, it's a talent show. show. Are either of you in it? No. Okay. I'm glad you that, told us about that, because I don't always get that kind of information at home, so it's, it's helpful to know. <laughs> that, I'm so glad you said that. Debbie, do you want to uh, just spend another minute on how much thought you've put into the calendar? Because I know it's something that you've oh. talked to a lot of us individually about. So just for the public's <laughs> awareness, do you want sure. to, because you went through that kind of quickly, and I, I just want the public to know that you've spent oh, a lot of time. We have. 
have spent a lot of time talking about it, haven't we? Um, it is always a dilemma when you go into that next week of school. So I think that the, the snow day we had that put us to Monday caused us to all of us to talk about it a lot individually. I've spoken to each of you individually several times. I appreciate you taking my calls to talk about the weather again. Um, I think when there's when there's a last day on a Monday, there's a little bit more motivation to say, is there anything else we can do? Um, we don't have professional development days, so it would have been a Saturday or it could have been a good Friday, could have been equal vacation week. But then once we had this the second day where it put us till Tuesday, I think in those conversations with you, we kind of mostly agreed that maybe um, you know now that we have two days to try to make up and we really don't have that time, maybe best to just let it lie. And the other reason is that that we accepting what might happen tomorrow morning, which will be very little and just slushy, um, I, we are still within the calendar that this committee set. So, you know, we always, we by law have to set a 180 day calendar for students, plus five snow days built in that everybody knows about. It's approved in advance, more than a year in advance. So we're, we're right now, we've had five days, we're right now ending on the last day of the officially voted calendar. So if we were for some reason outside the officially voted calendar, I think we'd have to really maybe think outside the box or come back together and decide. But since we are still within it, I think we all uh, collectively came to a you know, consensus majority that, that we would just let the calendar stay as is. And so we're officially ending it. Well, we did put, we talked about a lot of things. I've talked to several staff members. Um, you know, there's no one great way to go about it. So um, if you, if we were to try to think of an outside the box day or two days now to go to school, you know, there's a lot of people who have made plans to travel on a long weekend that have family out of state. There are families who have, you know, no day is a good day at this point. So we're actually talking with the administrators about how do we make those last two days real, you know, a learning experience. It wouldn't be, you know, an ELA or math experience for prep for MCAS necessarily, but we can really find ways to make those a, a good learning experience in terms of how we view the total child and their development as a citizen. So we've got a couple of ideas about that. You know, maybe some schools are looking into maybe making one a day of community service, for example. So we're, we're definitely looking to some things that would make it a meaningful day of learning um, in some way. So that, after our long um, discussions over the last several weeks, is the conclusion that we came to. But also, you know, the entire public has known for 15 months right. that the, the five days have been there, and like everybody knows, 16 months in advance, everybody knows that the possible last day of school in the next calendar year is June 25. So I'm, I'm wondering with a little visual here, if what if we put the block around June 25 as the last day of school next year, and then a parenthesis around the 18th, saying in the event that we do not have to go. So we could put two blocks, like say, say it was this year, on the 18th and the 25th, and put last day of school June 18 through 25. That but way I mean, it's sort I mean, of a, I mean, a non, you know, a we don't know yet kind of implication. That's not a, that's, that's well, we do live in New point. England, and we do know that it snows. But we don't know the variable of when or how much. So yeah, I really think we're Megan happy. don't really care when our last day of school is right now. No, but the last day of school is well. the twenty fourth <laughs> <laughs> of May. Of May. Well, I mean, I think for purposes of this year, the timing of the storms in February oh. and March has sort of dictated that we're going. To That's right. The end of June, but we're we not did. The only city <coughs> no, oh, absolutely. Well, actually, there are there are a couple of districts that went right through to the end. So if we're ending on 20, 28th, and they still had another day, so they have to put in a day on either the vacation or Good Friday, and still go to Friday or Saturday. So, but we're going not in the forward, worst you know, we do we we're we've lost five days of academics, and we replace them with five days at the end of June that are not particularly academic. I mean, they're June. It's it's the tail end of the school year and I know that's the way we've always done it, but maybe it is time to start thinking down the road about how to replace like the days we lost in October. Perhaps in hindsight, we could have thought more about replacing those days with academic days during the school year. And it's just a contingency plan. We've had weird weather the last 2 mm -hmm. years. And 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 this I mean there's just no way to really make up what has been lost at the end of the I year. I think the 
I don't think that's a bad idea, but I think the challenge about that is if if you're if we're going to make ongoing changes to the calendar throughout the year, I mean, we publish yeah. it so that families can plan, right, and so that our staff can plan, right. So if we're going so to be, be you know have yeah. early days, if you're going to change the calendar mid year, it it. it it may not be the best way to go, like because the contingency days are expected to be built on at the end. That's the way the regulations state to add five to the end. Mm -hmm. So if if we if we want to do something different than that, we'd have to say it up front in the calendar that we're going to be going to school during a certain vacation week, for example. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how you do that because we shouldn't be changing the calendar constantly during the year. Well, people put so, things a year ahead of time or six months ahead of time, and then you. That's that's right. the problem is you'd be constantly revoting the and calendar and that leads to a different set of problems that might be equally challenging. I think it also gives the parents um, the opportunity before we vote to contact us to contact the administration about concerns that they have about the calendar mm -hmm. before we as a committee vote. If we if we then decide during the school year to change that. Um, I think school that that might be a call from anybody. No, I'm just saying no, that. But I'm, I'm just saying. It's, it is what it is. Well, right. I, think, I think there has been a fair amount of dialogue in the community, which is one of the reasons why I'm talking I wanted... about the onset, though. Just yeah. clarification, not the most recent. I mean, yeah. oh, yeah. I mean the very well, beginning. Well, that's why I, I wanted Debbie to make I received one email. I received yeah, I did, one too. Email. I received I, one email I think, too. if nothing else, I think this year has been a reminder that we publish a last day of school, but we also say that there are five more days of potential school yeah. based on cancellation. And I think... I think especially if you're newer parents or you don't study the calendar quite as closely as we do, mm -hmm. people may not realize that. So in the f this may be a good year for a reminder or a lesson that, mm -hmm. you but know I what, it's hard to... Just, just we can just box off. We That's not a change that you would have to revoke. No. But we no. can box it off and put box it last off. day could be anywhere between here and here. And maybe parentheses, well, the, you know, I would suggest parentheses around the 18th and the, the block around 25. So be. that they... Very good. I mean, they, and they know, we know this 16 months in advance. Just on a, on a different positive note, you never know where our alumni is going to show up. And um, surprisingly enough, one of our um, former graduates, Phil Kelly, who also gra graduated from Harvard Law, his mom and I were very good friends, um, was on being interviewed in, at the Vatican. To be there with his family oh, okay. at the time when um, the Pope was there, he was actually on TV and uh, interviewed by Anderson Cooper. Oh, okay. So you know, what's the chances? He's living in Texas. <laughs> he goes to Italy on a vacation, winds up staying there because of what's going on. Is actually there when this happened mm. and was interviewed by him, and it was like, oh my God, you know, it's I know amazing. this person. So yeah. it is amazing. Oh, okay. you, know, you never know where our alumni is going to show up. Uh, well, that's exciting. something they'll never forget. Never oh, I'm not kidding. No one there will forget that. I know. We're actually running on time. We are running on time, and I now will entertain a motion, motion to move into executive session. I'll make that motion. Second. Bruce? Second. Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. 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 Five ayes. Uh, we will not. We are going into executive session. For the purposes of negotiating strategies with junior personnel, school bus drivers, and school security, we will not return to open session.